Welcome and good evening to the uh, ELI Young Lawyers Award and followed by the ELI SIG and HUB Awards. It has become a tradition that uh, the ELI every year uh, gives a prize to a young promising lawyer, could be a practicing lawyer, could be an academic. And this year, the winner is Paolo Mazzotti, who is joining us and uh, we very much welcome him and congratulate him on the price. We'll say a few more, more words about that later, later on. Um, the um, leading idea behind giving the price is that the Institute wants to connect with young legal professionals, and that includes academic young legal professionals. Uh, we want to stimulate that young people become active in our Institute, become involved, become members, um, and contribute to the development of the law in Europe, which is the aim of the Institute. Um, until I think this year, mostly the papers were on topics that related to IT, so internet technology, so the data economy. But this year there was a change. And in fact, in the topics, you can see that the interest of students, of young people is changing. Um, the changes towards, well, what is happening with our climate? Um, and we can see that in the paper written by Paolo Mazzotti, um, and the title is uh, Stepping Up the Enforcement of Trade and Sustainable Development, Chapters in the European Union's Free Trade Agreements, Reconsidering the Debate on Sanctions. And so it's essentially about sustainability and trade, but sustainability. It can be expected that in the future, um, other themes will also uh, be, will be getting more to the forefront, like mass migration, what we now see happening. Um, the consequence of pandemics have already drawn the attention of many. So basically we see the big problems that we face today and in the future coming back in the various papers presented to us. Now, this year, it was really very difficult making a choice as the papers um, were of excellent quality, um, various topics, some IT, some not IT, um, but finally we selected this paper. Um, Paolo Mazzotti is at the moment um, uh, a graduate at the uh, uh, Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva. Uh, he is an alumnus of Trento University. And then he followed courses at several other universities and among others, my former home university, Maastricht. Um, and uh, it's an incredible uh, CV. Uh, you've also been, Paolo, an intern economic affairs office of the Embassy of Italy in Tokyo. So you've already have quite some experience and quite some, some, some back, background. Um, the way we will do it is I will now pass the floor to um, my colleague member of the jury, uh, John North, the past president of Interlegas, who will say a few more words. And then we pass the floor to Paolo to give a presentation and basically an overview of his paper. John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chef. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, first, I would like to say how pleased I am to be able to join the webinar today and be part of the European Law Institute AB AGM. Um, although I'm sure that we were all hoping that we would have been in, able to meet in Vienna this year, a great programme has again been put together. And um, I'm sure that this year's virtual event will be a great success. Interleges is proud to be a member of the European Law Institute and to sponsor the ELI Young Lawyers Award again in 2021. Interleges is an international association of independent law firms based in various jurisdictions in Europe and around the world. It shares many of the same aims as the European Law Institute and so recognises the importance of learning from the achievements of different legal cultures, sharing know-how and taking a genuinely international perspective in dealing with legal issues when these arise for the clients of our member firms. Um, we were founded in 1989 by a small group of like-minded law firms who saw the opportunities and benefits of strengthening links in other jurisdictions at a time when 
boundaries in Europe were coming down. We recognised from an early date the importance of encouraging and recognising young lawyers as being the voices and leaders of the future, whether you're viewing the law from an academic or commercial perspective. Indeed, for a number of years, Interlego has organised a similar award to the LI Young Lawyers Award, which was aimed at undergraduate and postgraduate students or newly qualified lawyers who were at the start of their careers. This has now developed into a secondment scheme where Interlego sponsors a young lawyer from a member firm to undertake a project and produce a piece of work on a legal or law firm management issue of international interest while based at the offices of another member law firm in the network in another jurisdiction. Although the secondment scheme has been suspended over the last couple of years because of the pandemic, it is very much hoped that we can restart the scheme in 2022 if circumstances permit. Interlegas is honoured to have been the sponsor for the ELI Young Lawyers Award for the last four years and to see how it's developed since its inception in 2016. The benefits of award schemes are sometimes questioned, but to me, the ELI Young Lawyers Award scheme more than fulfills its, fulfills its objective of giving the young European legal community a mechanism to propose practical suggestions for the improvement of European law and so contribute to the improvement of European law for the benefit of citizens and businesses alike. Chef alluded to the challenges of the pandemic. These are proposed, these are the challenges proposed by the pandemic and the signs over the summer, of the growing impact of global warming mean that it is likely that governments and institutions around the world will have to take into account as wide a range of viewpoints as possible if they are to adequately address the problems caused by, caused by these issues. Wisdom arising through experience is of course important, but it is also essential that we benefit from the input of the young as they often have a different and perhaps more relevant perspective on the issues that we have to address. This is particularly so in the case of the environment and working in social issues where the perspective of the young can be very different from people from an earlier generation like myself. This year's entries for the LI award were again of extremely high quality and covered a broad range of topics, including everything from data protection to sustainable finance. As a judge of the LI Young Lawyers Award for the last three years, it has been gratifying to see the knowledge and talent displayed by this and previous year's entrants. Previous winners of the ELI Young Lawyers Award have written on topics as diverse as blockchain, competition law, the principles around the mutual recognition of the European arrest warrant and data protection. Although as Chef mentioned, there has been a bias previously towards IT, um, although this is clearly changing. This year's winning entry by Paolo stood out to me because of its topicality in contributing to the debate around the best way to enforce the trade and sustainability chapters or TSD chapters of the EU's free trade agreements in the event of a dispute. It also stood out because of its willingness to challenge the widely accepted view on the best way of ensuring compliance in that area where a trading partner of the EU has been found not to be complying with its obligations under the TSD chapter in its free trade agreement. As we emerge and rebuild from the pandemic, it is likely that the status quo will continue to be challenged. This is particularly likely to be the case in the areas commonly covered by TSD chapters, which, for example, commit the EU and its trading partners to uphold standards contained in multilateral agreements, such as the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and international labour organisation conventions. As I mentioned above, the extreme weather events of the summer whether it be the recent devastating flooding in New York, the extreme heat and droughts in Western Canada and the United States, or the wildfires in Greece and Turkey, have brought into sharp focus the need to address climate change. In addition, COVID has challenged established working patterns and increased calls for better workers' right, conditions and rights in countries around the world. All of this is likely to increase political and public pressure on the EU and its member governments generally, for DST chapters to be seen to produce improvements and for them to be enforced effectively in the event of dispute. Given what I've said, I believe that it is likely that there will be increased scrutiny on the terms of EU free trade agreements 
and the effectiveness of the TSD chapters in particular. There will be an increased focus on whether TSD chapters are actually leading to improved environmental and employment conditions in the EU's partner countries and as to the extent of the, those improvements. Paolo's submission makes a persuasive case that having the possibility of using sanctions may be a valuable additional tool for the EU rather than having to rely solely on the current promotional model whereby soft pressure is applied to induce compliance with the terms of TSD chapters. So his argument is that sanctions can be seen as a complement rather than to contradict the EU's promotional approach towards sustainability. I do not want to give too much more away on the content of Paolo's submission, and so on behalf of Interlegas, I would like to congratulate him again for being the winner of the ELI Young Lawyers Award 2021, and to hand over to him so that he can give a presentation on his excellent submission. Paolo, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much to Mr. North and Professor Paner. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, everything is still working. So, okay, I will start sharing my screen because I prepared some slides. I assume this, okay, is this being shared? Yep, this is uh, working. Okay, so uh, yes, as Mr. North and Professor Fenerpa were mentioning, my, my submission relates to the problem of enforcement of trade and sustainable development chapters in the, the European Union's free trade agreements which is um, a topic I have uh, started being, oops, sorry, I can't, okay. I have started being um, interested in doing my last, uh, in the last years of my studies where my, I took, uh, I started taking seriously, so to say, uh, the questions surrounding the implementation of the sustainable development agenda in international economic uh, law in particular. And in like while addressing these topics, I uh, found out that there is quite a lot of the debate which has been taking place in the last, I would say, five or six years uh, concerning, uh, uh, as Mr. North was mentioning, what is the most appropriate way <clears throat> to uh, enable the enforcement of the uh, sustainability commitments so relating with environmental standards or uh, labor protection standards which are let down in these chapters of the European Union's free trade agreements with a view to ensuring that those commitments uh, do not just uh, remain on paper without having an actual bearing on the practice of international economic relations and this is like I found out that I found most of the arguments which were being put forward like rather unpersuasive in this respect. And it is the this is the topic I would like to address in my presentation and which I devoted my paper to. So uh, I will just start very quickly by referencing the relevance of sustainable development to EU law and policy, um, which is like the, a priori for the uh, conceptual framework surrounding TSD chapters in the European Union's free trade agreement. So the European Union uh, is bound by its primary law to uh, pursuing a sustainable development agenda in a number of respects, uh, which as the uh, opinion 215, which was handed down in 2017 by the European Court of Justice, and it is a landmark opinion, which has been very, very much commented upon. Um, so as this been makes clear, this uh, obligation also regards the common commercial policy. Um, basically, the way by which the European Union uh, abides by this commitment is inter alia, and I would say it is the, the most significant way by envisaging TSD chapters in, uh, Euro in the free trade agreements which are struck with third countries. Uh, this has started being practiced in the last 10 years. Starting with the FTA, so free trade agreement, I will use this uh, form in the following uh, with South Korea, but now regards a number of FTAs, uh, such as, for instance, Japan, um, Vietnam, uh, Singapore. It is also envisaged to take place in the FTA, which will eventually, perhaps, and hopefully, be struck with Mercosur. And um, Basically, this commitment is brought forward by a number of substantive obligations, which I will not focus upon in this presentation. And I, I will take them for granted, but they basically relate to 
on the one hand, ensuring that multilateral commitments in the environmental and labor fields are effectively complied with, on the one hand, and on the other hand, by relating to various techniques, uh, striving to have the trading partners um, uh, reaching advancements in the levels of protection of environmental and labor interest. But uh, as I was mentioning, I will focus upon the issue of implementation of those commitments, taking them for granted on the from a substantive point of view. And basically, if one reads through the FTAs struck by the European Union, they will find out that um, when disputes arise regarding the proper implementation by one of the trading partners of uh, an obligation which is enshrined into one of those agreements, there are there is a like a dichotomy of dispute settlement mechanisms which can be deployed by a complaining party to secure compliance with those obligations. So as a general matter, um, there is a model which is modeled after the World Trade Organization's one. So basically the complaining party is to enter into consultations with the trading party, with the alleged breacher, uh, in order to reach a mutually, a mutually satisfactory solution. Where this cannot take place, uh, the complaining party can request arbitration concerning compliance with that obligation. And um, if after an arbitral award is handed down, further disagreement arises as to whether the defeated party uh, has complied with the prescriptions which are contained into the award, um, the complaining party can request being authorized to adopt so-called sanctions, which are basically suspensions of the economic concessions which are uh, made under the FTA itself. So typically this uh, involves raising tariffs which uh, had been uh, lowered um, pursuant to the FTA itself. Uh, still, like this is the general mechanism, but when um, disagreement rises as to the proper implementation of an obligation contained in a trade and sustainable development chapter, um, the like the latest stage of the procedure, so to say, is removed from the toolkit, I would say. So uh, consultations can still be entered into, the arbitration can be requested, but if further disagreement rises later as to whether the uh, illegality found out to be in place by the uh, arbitral panel arises, there is no possibility to um, request the um, authorization to put in place sanctions. And this is a, a deliberate policy, which the European Commission has defended. Well, obviously, it has put it in practice, but it has also uh, supported it pursuant to uh, an express debate, which was held on this point between 2017 and 2018 with a number of stakeholders. Um, so, because obviously there was a line of thought which posted that this dichotomy between uh, dispute settlement mechanisms could not be justifiable, and it actually led to shortcomings in on ineffective compliance with um, the TSD obligations enshrined in FTAs. And my paper actually focuses on the uh, scholarly and to a certain extent political narrative, which has uh, been matching this um, policy by the Commission, because uh, until the 2017-2018 debate, uh, scholarly thought appeared to be mostly critical of the failure to um, in include sanctions as a means of enforcement of TSD obligations. But after that debate, uh, somehow paradoxically, in my, in my opinion, but mm, this stands as a fact, um, like the scholarly debate is uh, taking another direction, which is actually uh, supportive of the discourse renouncing sanctions as a means of implementation of TSD obligations on the part of the European Union. And um, I tried to sum up the lines of thought which have been posited in this debate into two main strands, which in my paper I define uh, the conceptual critiques to sanctions, because I chose to focus on these um, arguments because they are, as I said, conceptual. So they regard uh, sanctions as such. And this is of no prejudice for further debates concerning the practical operation of sanctions, which are still present and can be served in the literature, but um, I will leave them aside in the following. Uh, so basically there are these two arguments which are being put forward by the critics of sanctions, one of which is what I call the ineffectiveness argument, which 
can be uh, seen in this very brief excerpt from an article published on the Common Market Law Review by Gracia Marin Duran, uh, which published in the last year, which basically questions the uh, effectiveness of sanctions uh, meant as the capability of sanctions of um, inducing the behavioral change they aim at, because obviously sanctions are uh, meant to exert economic pressure on the defeated party so that the incentive provided by the possibility to uh, revive the preferences which have been granted under the FTA and which are being suspended pursuant to the sanctioning decision provides that party uh, um, an economic incentive to comply with environmental and labor standards. And basically this uh, argument posits that a survey of uh, the practice of sanctions, uh, which is mostly based on research, which was carried out like as early as in the 80s um, on the uh, practice of sanctions adopted by the United States shows that um, sanctions have seldom been able to uh, induce this change. And this is coupled with the so-called the shooting myself in the foot argument, which basically posits that um, the country adopting sanctions is also facing economic harm on the, uh, because of the disruption of trade caused by sanctions itself. And basically, uh, this is a lose-lose game. So there is no reason to adopt them because um, like you are not able to incentivize compliance and at the same time you are causing harm to yourself. And I take issue with the, this uh, argument mostly because uh, the very same research which the authors uh, supportive of this discourse draw upon has been shown by later research which is being basically uh, ignored by the proponents of this argument to be affected by uh, so-called selection bias. So the results uh, um, that basically sanctions were unable to influence the behavior of other actors uh, are influenced by the fact that the authors serving that practice only took into account cases where sanctions were actually imposed and despite their adoption, the uh, target country did not change their policy. But this later research, which was carried out uh, mostly by Daniel Dresner, uh, has actually shown that, on the contrary, if one broadens the scope of their inquiry to encompass also cases where sanctions were threatened without having actually been imposed so that they were not detected by the methodology uh, looking at cases where sanctions have been put in place, they will actually find out that sanctions provide uh, an effective incentive for uh, compliance with the, the line of policy uh, desired, so to say, by the actor imposing sanctions. And so my contention is that if we take seriously this um, outcome in political and economic science research, we actually uh, like are led to conclude that the ineffectiveness argument uh, is not decisive. And I also um, incidentally, uh, take note of the fact that the uh, like the pendant to the argument of ineffectiveness is that uh, the promotional model, so the current model without sanctions is more effective because uh, litigation is uh, an, a powerful incentive as such. Um, is uh, like this argument uh, takes, draws on the findings which can be found inferred from the practice of the World Trade Organization, where actually there are very, very uh, few cases where sanctions were imposed, uh, and those cases are uh, most often the cases where litigation, like the outcome of litigation was not eventually complied with. And uh, if one takes into account this broader framework, they also find out that the case of the WTO is not uh, a decisive in turn, because um, the fact that litigation in the WTO is usually effective uh, without any need for sanctions to be actually imposed can be actually explained by reference to the fact that under the WTO's um, dispute settlement understanding, sanctions are uh, eventually envisaged as a possible means of uh, enforcement. So uh, if we actually want to draw upon the WTO as a model to um, like for our TSD practice, we should 
actually acknowledged that a key factor for litigation to be successful in the WTO itself is the very same fact that uh, sanctions can be eventually adopted. And so, we sh in my submission, the European Union should consider uh, broadening the scope of sanctions under its current uh, dispute settlement mechanism in free trade agreements um, to uh, cover TSD litigation as well. Whereas the second argument, which I take issue with, is what I call the counterproductivity argument, which can also be seen in these excerpts, which um, I am now displaying, which has actually two uh, slight variants. So uh, on the one hand, it is predicated that sanctions, to the extent that they are meant to, and they actually cause uh, economic harm, risk uh, exacerbating uh, sustainability problems, because, um, so the argument goes, uh, if a government fails to comply with, say, an environmental treaty because they do not have enough resources for the uh, like environmental protection or um, decarbonization or reconversion programs which are uh, necessary for that multilateral treaty to be complied with, causing uh, economic harm might uh, lead to even more, even less, sorry, resources being available to that government so that sustainable development might uh, eventually be hampered more than it is served by the imposition of sanctions. Whereas the second variant, so, so to call it, is a little bit more elaborate and it basically posits that sustainable development is not harmed as such by sanctions, but sanctions basically um, like open an escalation of political tension between the sender country, so in this case the European Union, and the target country, so in this case the trading partner facing sanctions, which basically disrupts the cooperative processes which are needed for um, the regulatory changes uh, in the labor and or environmental domain to be uh, brought about in order for uh, those obligations to be complied with. And I actually um, label these arguments in the paper as artificial because um, uh, I think, and my, my submission is that there is an inherently contradictory logic in this argument because um, if we assume that sanctions do harm to, to labor and or environmental interests as such, uh, we should also acknowledge that we should not adopt sanctions in turn, not even to enforce the e properly economic concessions um, which are granted under free trade agreements, uh, that which the European Union uh, is actually ready to do. So, because uh, like being ready to harm sustainable development to effectively enforce economic concessions, but not to uh, enforce uh, sustainable development standards as such, uh, seems to imply an assumption that it is more important to uh, enforce economic concessions uh, than it is to effectively enforce uh, social and or environmental standards. But this cannot be accepted under the current uh, EU primary law, which actually, as I briefly mentioned at the outset, uh, obliges the European Union to uh, holistically address the components of sustainable development. So the economic, the social, and the environmental components rank equally and the difference in the means of enforcement which arises from this disparity cannot be justified as a matter of law. And further, and this is my last argument, this uh, artificiality of the uh, counterproductivity argument is uh, even more upscaled by the fact that under the so-called uh, GSP, so the generalized system of preferences, which is actually an a uh, unilateral uh, system of trade concessions made by the European Union to its uh, developing trading partners. Um, sanctions coming in the shape of withdrawals of those uh, concessions are still available uh, and even on, as a matter of practice, uh, on grounds related to sustainable development. So failure to comply with labor rights uh, and failure to abides by particularly important treaties in the uh, environmental domain. And 
to me, the uh, fact that the opponents of sanctions in the FTA domain do not question the withdrawal of GSP preferences on the very same um, sustainable development grounds which the proponents of sanctions uh, call to, for, to, to be available for the adoption of sanctions in the FTA domain uh, shows the fact that uh, there is like a sort of discourse which is meant to exclude sanctions like as a matter of um, political decision, uh, which is, I think, uh, also like, respectable because obviously, for instance, the counterproductivity argument in respect of cooperative processes uh, is a very legitimate concern, but uh, I think um, the, this discourse should be uh, made explicit rather than being, to a certain extent at least, uh, and so this is my impression, concealed under this narrative. And so basically my proposal would be that of reconsidering, as I mentioned in the title, the debate on sanctions, acknowledging that the two main strands of arguments which um, are being uh, used to uh, legitimize the current practice of not resorting to sanctions to enforce sustainability standards uh, are mm, fallacious to a certain extent, or this is uh, my perception on this, and rather uh, accepting the availability of sanctions in the TSC domain, which does not mean that the uh, EU should systematically sanction its trading partners on sustainable development grounds, also, because uh, under the general dispute settlement mechanism, uh, as I was mentioning, uh, sanctions can only be authorized at the end of a lengthy litigation, which the EU does not appear to be ready to start in the first place, because we, uh, we have seen the very first arbitral award on a TSD issue being handed down in the dispute with South Korea uh, just at the beginning of uh, 2021. Uh, with the FTA having entered into force in 2011, plenty of FTAs having entered into force in the meanwhile, without uh, litigation on TSD obligations being actually uh, started by the European Union. So uh, sanctions should be, in my submission, available as a measure of last resort, which would incidentally, as I was briefly um, stating while mentioning the case of the WTO, also be a way to streamline the effectiveness on, uh, of litigation as such, because litigation would then benefit from the abstract threat of the possibility uh, for sanctions to be adopted without also uh, giving up reflection on alternative solutions which uh, might actually exit this uh, false dichotomy as it has been labeled in the literature. Uh, between sanctions and non-sanctions, uh, for instance, considering, as I uh, briefly mentioned in this slide, by also recalling uh, some proposals which have been put forward in, in the literature, the possibility for smart sanctions targeted at influential uh, individuals or corporations being um, involved in egregious violations of sustainability standards, or for instance, financial penalties not calling into question the uh, trade concessions as such, which would basically all be strategies to uh, exercise economic pressure upon the target government, minimizing the collateral damage being uh, brought about to the economy and so individuals and companies in that country in turn, uh, which, and these are just for two very uh, brief proposals, uh, which should be seen, as Mr. North was also mentioning in his introduction, as complements rather than alternatives to the current approach uh, adopted by the EU in the field of enforcement of TSD obligations. And this is basically the main line of argument which I, I, I bring about in my paper and my presentation ends here. So I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much once again the the European uh, Law Institute, Professor Van Erp and Mr. North uh, and all this incredibly vibrant community for offering me this opportunity and remain available for any question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a very clear 
presentation and you did what so far everyone did uh, during panels that I chaired, you stay within the time limit. And that also is a compliment. Um, so essentially what you are arguing is that uh, um, economic targets in a way are hard targets for the EU, but sustainability is in a way a soft target. And what you argue is that it should also be a hard target and treat it in that same way. That is essentially what you're arguing. And I think that is definitely a good point you uh, which you made. Now, I understand that the price is on its way to you. Um, I think I can speak on behalf of John North that both John and I would have preferred very much giving you the price in person. Uh, that is not possible yet, but um, the price is on its on its way. So thank you very much. Congratulations also for me as chair of the jury again. Um, and I'm sure that um, your, your career um, will uh, bring you uh, uh, into, uh, I think, academia uh, when I look at your track record. But also, I think, as a practitioner lawyer, I think you would do very, very, very well because the way you can put forward arguments and present your, your views is, uh, is really impressive. So thank you for your presentation. Thank you, John, for participating. And I understand that uh, we now hand over to the president of the ELI, Christiane Wenderhorst, for the uh, SIG and HUB Awards. Christiane, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Chef. And let me start by congratulating Paolo for his great achievement. We're really proud to have such young people among our ranks who really enrich our uh, annual conference every year. But I would also like to thank uh, Interleges for having sponsored the Young Lawyers Award for many years now. This is so important to have the young generation participate in the ELI's work. And of course, I would like to thank you, Chef, for having chaired the jury for so many years. Uh, this is a lot of work. We get many papers, many excellent papers. They have to be read, they have to be ranked. Um, uh, discussions uh, have to be uh, conducted. And so thank you so much for everyone uh, engaged in this uh, Young Lawyers Award. And it's exciting also for me every year because I uh, never get any information about uh, uh, who is the winner. So it was very exciting also for me uh, uh, this year. But now we, we come to another exciting moment. Uh, Chef also mentioned we have further awards. Um, we also have ELI SIG and HUB awards. And uh, let me remind you that this is now the third time we um, have these awards. And uh, the reason is that our hubs and our SIGs are so immensely important for ELI's work. So the hubs are usually national hubs they mean that uh, ELI members can discuss topical issues in their native language close to their home. And the SIGs, the special interest groups, mean that ELI members interested in a particular topic can discuss those topics in depth and independently of the, the projects that are currently being undertaken uh, uh, by the ELI as such. And if I say independently, uh, that doesn't mean that SIGs are not important for our project work. Quite on the contrary, we have seen so many occasions where the inspiration for a project and ultimately also the project team uh, came from uh, an SIG. And uh, we, we really hope that many more ELI projects will be inspired and initiated by SIGs. And I would like to thank all our hubs and SIGs in particular for having carried on during the pandemic. It was particularly challenging for them. And we are really, really grateful to all the chairs, to all the members for having carried on. And it is for this reason that, again, it was a really, really difficult choice and a tough decision uh, for the executive committee. Um, we, we, we had a meeting, we discussed the uh, different arguments, and at the end of the day, we had to come up with a choice and with winners. And we 
we did come up with winners. Um, let me remind you who are the winners in, in, in 2019. They were the Digital Law SIG and uh, the Italian Hub and the Spanish Hub. Um, back then, you know, we couldn't make up our minds and so we chose both. The winners in 2020 were again the Digital Law SIG and the Spanish Hub. So you see a lot of continuity there. So this time, um, it, it's not the same SIG again, and it's not the same hub again. So let me maybe um, start with the SIG. So what can I say about that SIG? It is um, addressing a topic that's becoming more and more important, and that's on everybody's lips and on everybody's minds. It may hold true for some of the topics. So maybe that doesn't um, say much. It was founded in 2020. So it's a rather young SIG, but it has already uh, over 50 members. So um, that's quite impressive. And we also found it impressive that it has identified nine research topics and created subgroups on those nine research topics. Now, I'm not going to read out those research topics because that might give you already too much information. But anyway, nine uh, uh, subgroups is quite impressive. But then what, what really convinced us was that um, Already since the last awards, um, this SIG has um, launched uh, as many as 13 different webinars and international conferences. And is going to have another one and a big annual conference later this year. And these were not just smallish events. Um, uh, many of them had over 100 participants from all over Europe, from all across the globe, you could say. I was present in a couple of them, and I can say I was really, really impressed by the quality. So what more can I say without... Um, Maybe you've already realized um, which SIG I am talking about. And you're absolutely right. It is the environmental law SIG with in alphabetical order, William Boyd, who is Michael J. Klein Chair of Professor of Law at UCLA School of Law. And someone we already uh, know very well, Alberto de Franceschi, who is uh, a full professor of private law and holds a chair um, at the University of Ferrara. And I'm now wondering whether maybe one of them is present tonight and prepared to appear on the screen. I see I'll Alberto here. Hello, Alberto. Alberto, wait a sec. I think we met on this occasion before. Yes. So can it be that you change your main research topics every one or two years, you know, just to get the next SIG award? Is that the reason? That's perhaps one of the reasons. So thank you very much. And good evening, uh, Christiane and everybody. I'm very thankful for this uh, opportunity and for this acknowledgement. And uh, if you can see, say some words, some few words. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure. And actually, I would like to war warmly it looks very, very good. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I hand this over virtually oh, to you now. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I, I safely received it on my table right now. And, uh, and actually, I would like to warmly thank you, Chris, Christiane, and the entire ELI community for this award, uh, which actually goes to, to a group of people who very passionately 
engaged in the sustainability challenge uh, and from several legal fields. And uh, everyone, I would say, uh, had the courage to get out of the comfort zone to have a more environmental approach to their own disciplines. So I not really changed my research interests, by I try, but I tried rather to uh, give a sustainability nuance to those I was engaging in. And uh, it's not by chance that the first, one of the first uh, uh, events you mentioned, I'm very thankful that you opened the history of this SIG by taking the floor as the first speaker at the annual conference last year. This is, uh, we are very thankful of this uh, for your inspiration. I would say uh, the cross-cutting uh, 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 position of the digital uh, transformation and the synergy between environmental issues and digital transformation are very important, of course, at the core of the work of this environmental law, SIG. I would like to particularly thank uh, my brilliant co-chair, Professor William Boyd, and the over 30 speakers uh, from Europe, America, and Asia who presented uh, their valuable thoughts uh, and brought forward this uh, SIG and its uh, work. But uh, as we try to redecline the concept of environmental law as, as in, uh, in order to tackle the sustainability challenge, uh, William Boyd and I would like to invite every one of you who can be interested to join this group and to encourage the, uh, to make proposals for its further development and for shaping the future of this SIG and, the, and its contribution to the to a more sustainable society. Uh, this is uh, my thank, my warm thank uh, to you, Christiane, to the entire ELI for this opportunity to embark in a new challenge uh, for uh, responding to those very timely issues which are, uh, we are facing uh, nowadays. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Alberto, for having launched this really uh, impressive initiative. And so we will send you um, this here by post, but that's not the only thing. We will also send this one over. So um, it, it's very difficult to read and to see, and um, we, we will improve our procedures. So maybe next year, every have and sick chair has a 3D printer on their desk and we will send you know the data over so that these trophies are printed on their desk but for the time being uh, you just have to accept it uh, uh, like this and it will Thank arrive you. um, at your office or your home or wherever uh, very soon. So thank you so much again uh, uh, to you and to uh, your co-chair for everything you're doing and good luck and the best of success. We're really, really looking forward to uh, see the further work of the SIG and many more projects in the area of uh, environmental law and uh, sustainable development. Thank you very much, Christiane. Thank you. And now um, the hub, I mean, again, it was a very, very tough choice, maybe even more difficult, I have to confess. Um, this hub was uh, originally launched in 2014. There have been changes. Um, it has a new leadership and we were really, really impressed by what this hub is doing. So already since the last uh, uh, award ceremony, um, there were six really successful webinars. And um, we are very impressed to see that over the coming months, another eight webinars are on the agenda. And we are sure that they will be as successful um, as those that have already been held. Uh, there's also going to be very soon um, uh, a big conference and with a call for papers. So 
um, we are really, really impressed by uh, that agenda. There's also be an annual meeting of all the members. So um, we were really, really convinced by that report. And uh, the winner is um, have been a relatively um, young uh, member state of the European Union, a member state that has already once um, hosted uh, the annual conference. And I think uh, uh, in the meantime, you will have uh, realized um, which uh, hub I am talking about, right? It is the Croatian hub. So congratulations to the chairs, to the leadership of the Croatian hub. So Zoran uh, Hacic, uh, Hrvoje Pauković, Ivan Tot, um, they are the three leaders, and I hope that uh, one of them is prepared to appear on stage. Um, it's also fair to mention that Edita Churinovic Herz, uh, Hanan Horak, and Tatiana Josipovic and Svonimir Skiapover are the um, kind of advisory board that also has uh, a, a big role to play in this. Uh, hub and I see that Ivan Todd. Ivan Todd, congratulations. Um, again, you have already seen we don't have a 3D printer uh, in place, but uh, there is a document that's going to come very soon to your office or to wherever. And again, also in this case, you will get a trophy which says, of course, hub of the year instead of SIG of the year. But um, yeah, we are really, really proud of what you have achieved, uh, Ivan. Thank you so, so much. This is such an honor and uh, I really appreciate uh, the, this. Thank you for your kind words, uh, President Mendehorst, and uh, also many thanks uh, to the executive committee for uh, recognizing uh, our efforts and contributions uh, th this year. Uh, if I may correct you, there are four of us who are co-chairing the, oh, the, the, the hub. Uh, there is also, uh, beside myself and Zoran Hacic and Hrvoje Paukovic, Professor Emilia Micenic from oh, the University of Thank you so Korea. much for mentioning that, yeah. Uh, so I'm so honored to accept this award on behalf of uh, all of them, of our four for coaches, as well as, uh, as you mentioned, uh, on behalf of the Hubs Advisory Board, the uh, members, Professor Tatiana Osipovic, Lita Chunovic Hertz, uh, Hanna Horak, and Zvonimir Slakopper. Uh, let me take this opportunity to express uh, our deepest gratitude from all of us uh, to the Secretary General, Dr. Vanessa Wilcox, uh, who was of tremendous help to us in our efforts uh, to launch the, the Croatian uh, Hub. Uh, year and a half uh, ago. And many, many, many thanks to the amazing team at the Eli Secretariat uh, for their continued support to the Creation Hub, uh, in particular to Ms. Uh, Katya Coleman and Ms. Susanna Pachkova, uh, as well as for the part of this year uh, to Ms. Jessica uh, Poole. Uh, I promise you will keep up the word work and uh, be again a strong contender uh, for the next year's uh, awards. Uh, I hope that uh, we will join the, the big two, Italian and uh, Spanish hub uh, as, as uh, uh, con continued competitors for, for, the, uh, for the award uh, everywhere. Also, congratulations to Envi Envi Environmental Law Sigan Professor De Franceschi and also to me, Mr. Paul uh, Mazzotti uh, for winning the Eli's uh, Young Lawyers Award. Many thanks for, for everything. I wish you all a pleasant evening. Greetings from Zagreb. Well, thank you so much, Ivan, and 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 apologies for omitting Emilia. It's just because I I lost my glasses somewhere on my desk. So, um, apologies to to Emilia, and thank you so much again for all you're doing. And I can just resonate what you were saying about our uh, wonderful team at the Secretariat. Um, you know, we have a very very small team, and it's just amazing what they achieve. So um, I can really underline everything uh, you've said. And um, yeah, we are very glad to, to, to give support to uh, the hubs and the, the, the SIGs where we can. 
because these um, uh, sub organizations are so important for our work and we wish you all the best of success um, for for uh, the coming months and the coming years. Thank you so much. So um, yeah, now we know the winners uh, for this year, but of course next year, um, Pascal Pichonat, who is my successor as president of the ELI, uh, will award um, the, the, the trophies for uh, the coming year, 2022. So there's now a period of 12 months for all our hubs and six to compete and to organize webinars, to organize conferences, to contribute uh, in various ways to ELI uh, work, and then to file their report to the next uh, executive committee. I am sure the next executive committee um, will again have a very tough choice. I'm sure the next executive committee um, will again make a wise choice. And um, yes, I'm sure that all our hubs and all our SIGs will continue to really, really be an extremely valuable asset of this organization. And with that, I would like to thank again, everybody who is involved in a hub or in a SIG, in particular the chairs, in particular, the members of advisory boards, in particular, those that take an active function, such as leader of a thematic subgroup or so. And we are really looking forward to seeing many more hub and sync activities and many more ELI projects that kind of have their roots and that grow out of hub and sync activities. So with those words, I congratulate again, all our winners. I congratulate uh, Paolo Mazzotti again, the winner of the Young Lawyers Award. I congratulate um, the, the, the chairs and of course all members of the Environmental Law SIG. I congratulate the chairs, the advisory board members and all the members of the Creation Hub. And I'm looking forward to seeing uh, who will be the winners next year. So have a good evening. We will see each other again early tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. Make sure you don't miss our panels and I wish you uh, a pleasant evening and good night. <laughs>